Let's talk about how we can use mass spectrometry to determine the structure of organic molecules. So mass spectrometry involves an ionization of our sample and then some way of measuring the mass to charge ratio of those particular cations that we form. So let's take a look at uh, ways we might do this. Uh, mass spectrometry gives us molecular mass information and because things happen to those originally ionized compounds, they can fragment and we can look at the mass of the fragment ions to tell us something about the atomic connectivity of the molecule in question. So the most common form of mass spectrometry involves electron impact ionization and what we do is we take our molecule in the gas phase and we direct a beam of high energy electrons uh, towards it and some of those electrons are going to hit the molecules and they will knock an electron out of the valence shell of that organic molecule and then we end up with a charged species, a cationic species. They will be molecular uh, ions and those molecular ions stuff can happen to them. We'll talk about that in just a second. So our first example we're going to look at is propane. We take propane, we put it in the gas phase, we hit it with a high energy electron beam and when we do that we knock one of the valence electrons out. We now have an electron deficient species which is positively charged and as it turns out for organic molecules uh, we will have an unpaired electron, at least one unpaired electron and we talk about these things as being a radical cation. That's the initially formed cation. Now other stuff can happen but let's take a look at the mass spectrometer itself. So we have something where we can inject our sample. Uh, we typically heat it so that we can vaporize our sample and we shoot a high energy beam of electrons toward to ionize the sample. We then have a couple of charged plates that will accelerate those initially formed ions towards uh, a portion of the spectrometer where we have a strong magnet. That magnetic field will deflect any ions that come towards it and it will deflect light ions more than it will deflect heavy ions. And at the end of this tube, uh, we have a detector and those ions that are deflected a lot because they're light will be counted on this side of the detector. And those molecular fragments or molecules that have a larger mass will be deflected less and will be detected on the other side of the detector. So in effect, what we do is count uh, the number of impacts that happen in a certain region, the heavier ones hitting here and the lighter ones hitting here. So let's take a look at what can happen uh, with propane. We throw propane into our mass spectrometer. The first thing that we do is make this propane radical cation. That turns out to be somewhat unstable species and it flies apart. It fragments. When it fragments, it can form a cation and in this particular instance, we break off one of the carbon-carbon bonds. We break off this methyl group, and we form a methyl radical and an ethyl cation. In our mass spectrometer, neutral species don't get deflected. They just run into the side of the wall if, if the fragmentation occurs. Uh, but only the charged species will get deflected. So our mass spectrometer only detects ions. And in the experiment that we're doing, it's cations that we'll be detecting, okay? So we will detect that daughter ion. It can fragment in another way to form a methyl cation and an ethyl radical. Now, thermodynamics will determine the relative amounts of fragmentation that occur, with more fragmentation occurring to produce typically the more stable cation. Radical stability also uh, determines the fragmentation, but as it turns out, the cation stability is more important, and we will see more fragmentation to form the ethyl cation than the methyl cation because second or primary cations are much more stable than methyl cations. Now, if we were to able to form a secondary cation, we would expect to see even more of those. In this particular instance, uh, we can't do a fragmentation that forms a secondary cation. So let's take a look at the mass spec for propane and a couple of things we want to know about this. 
A, that's just the horizontal axis, and the further to the right tells us that cations detected in this area are heavier. They have a higher mass to charge ratio. Uh, they get deflected less, and uh, this particular D, that is represented by the, that's the propyl, the propane radical cation itself. At C, that has a mass of 29. That's due to the ethyl cation. This one at 15 is due to the methyl cation. The base peak is whatever peak is the largest peak, and then we set that uh, arbitrarily at 100, and all the other peak sizes are relative to that base peak. The base peak may or may not be the molecular ion. In this case, it's not. In this case, fragmentation occurs to a significant amount, and our base peak is due to the ethyl cation. We do see our molecular ion, and your molecular ion is typically one of the heavier ones. It's not necessarily the heaviest. Uh, that's due to uh, a molecular ion that has another isotope of carbon in it. And we'll talk about that momentarily. So we see a number of things. We see uh, A and B are simply our axis. C is the base peak, which may or may not be the molecular ion. And we typically see the molecular ion, and it will be close to the heaviest of the fragments that we see. <clears throat> so let's dissect this a little bit more. One of the things you want to be careful of, we're not detecting the average mass. The average mass is the molecular mass that you use when you go into the lab and you want to uh, do a synthesis, uh, some reaction, and you have to determine the molar amount of material so that you get the stoichiometry right in your reaction. That's the average mass. And the average mass of a molecule is obtained by summing up the, atom the average atomic masses of the constituent elements. The mass number is a little bit different, also called the nucleon number. It's the number of protons and neutrons in an atomic nucleus. Hydrogen, for example, can have an atomic mass of one, in which case it just has a proton in its nucleus and no neutrons. You can also have hydrogen with a uh, atomic mass of two. That's called deuterium. It's a specific isotope of hydrogen, and it has a proton and a neutron in it. Now, as it turns out, most hydrogen simply has a proton in its nucleus and no nuclei, no uh, neutrons. So most hydrogen has an atomic mass of one, with some hydrogen having an atomic mass of two. Now, exact mass is slightly different. We all can also measure that in uh, a good mass spectrometer, and we'll not bother with that, but the exact mass is calculated by each, the exact mass of every molecule in it, of every atom in the molecule. Now let's take a look at another mass spectrum. This is the mass spectrum for benzene, and what we see in this case is we have a peak at 78. That is the molecular ion, which we'll also often just depict as either M indicating that it's a radical kind cation. Sometimes we'll just call it M+. plus. That means it's the molecular ion. Okay. Now, right here is the M plus 1, oops, the M plus 1 peak. That's right, this peak right here. And that particular peak is due mostly to benzene molecules that have one isotope of carbon that has a mass of 13. It could also have a hydrogen in it that has a mass of 2 rather than a mass of 1. That's why we see an M plus 1 peak. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Now notice this particular molecule didn't fragment very much. That's because these bonds are difficult to break and when we form the radical cation, it doesn't fragment a lot, and most of the molecular ion survives until it gets to the detector, and we see the mass-to-charge ratio of 78. 
If we were to look at something like hexane, hexane, on the other hand, uh, has relatively weak carbon-carbon bonds uh, relative to benzene. And when we form the radical cation, remember we have CH3, CH2, CH2, we have six carbon atoms. And when we form that radical cation, we can break those carbon-carbon bonds. When it fragments, any one of the carbon-carbon bonds in this particular molecule can break, and it can break to form a, a pentyl cation and a methyl radical. Remember, we don't see the radicals. We only see the cation, and we see that M plus minus 15 because it will have a, a fragment mass of 71, the, the pentyl cation. We can also break it up at the next position, and as it turns out, that then is M plus minus 29 because we've lost the ethyl radical, and we see the butyl cation. We only see the cations. And then we have M plus minus 43. That's due to this fragmentation. And we can also break the bond to form, instead of the ethyl radical, we form the butyl radical and a ethyl cation, and we see that at M plus minus 57. Now notice we don't see the methyl cation here. Probably some is formed, it's just it's in such a small amount that we don't detect it uh, in this particular instance. That's because we detect much more of these other ions, okay? And we also see the unfragmented molecular ion, that is the largest uh, mass peak uh, that is of significant size. Notice we also see this M plus 1 peak uh, at 87. That would be at 87. And that's due to uh, some of the molecules of hexane will have uh, a C13 atom in them rather than the, the regular C12 isotope of carbon. So we get a lot of information from this. Not only do we see the molecular ion, but we can also talk about the different fragmentations that occur, the different bonds that break, and we have evidence for that by seeing the significant mass of those cations that are formed. So we, we can put all this together, and this represents a hexane molecule, uh, and we have good evidence for it. Now we've talked about the isotopes, so remember, most carbon is carbon-12. Only 1% of carbon is carbon-13. So we see very small M plus 1 peaks. Uh, and even the fragment peaks, we will see a very small one next to it due to some C13 being in those fragments. Hydrogen, most hydrogen is has an atomic mass of 1. A very small amount of hydrogen, 0.011% has an atomic mass of two. So it doesn't alter our spectra that much. But carbon, we can often see what we call the M plus one peak. Now when we take a look at this, we see that most of our compounds have a predominant isotope. But when we get down to chlorine and bromine, we see that chlorine has a significant number of isotope that has an M plus 2 peak. So most chlorine is 35, has an atomic mass of 35, but 24.22% of chlorine will have an atomic mass of 37. And bromine is about 50-50 between bromine 79 and bromine 81. So we see significant M plus 2 peaks in compounds that have chlorine or bromine in them. And not only that, we, we will see some uh, specific patterns. So let's take a look at these peaks that go beyond the molecular ion due to isotopes. So for species with carbon, here we see a mass spec for simple molecule of methane, just CH4. Okay, and there's the base peak and the molecular ion peak for methane is at 16. Notice we see a small peak 
at 17, and that is due to methane that has a carbon-13 atom in it. It's a very small peak, and it turns out it'll be approximately 1% the size of the M plus peak, of the molecular ion peak. We talk about this again, we call that the M plus 1 peak. So if we have more carbons, we have more probability that there will be a C13 in there. So if we uh, have something like decane, decane has 10 carbon atoms, we will see a significantly larger M plus 1 peak. And as it turns out, if we have 10 carbons, we should see 11.24% of the M plus 1 peak relative to the molecular ion peak. That's always relative to the molecular ion peak, not the base peak but the molecular ion peak. So we expect to see a significant peak when we have a lot of carbon atoms. That can be diagnostic. You can actually throw these into an isotope calculator at this website, and that can be confirmation that you have the molecule that you're looking for. So we can glean some information from that N plus one peak. Now, we don't really use that a lot unless we happen to be uh, people that are really interested in mass spectrometry. But peaks that are significant for structure determination are due to chlorine and bromine. So for example, if we have chlorobenzene, we expect to see a very large M plus 2 peak in a ratio of about 3 to 1 in the M plus and the M plus 2 peaks. And that's because of the isotopic distribution of chlorine. 76% of it is chlorine 35 and 24% is chlorine 24. So whenever you see that pattern of the M plus or the molecular ion and the M plus 2 peak, which is the molecular ion plus 2, it's due to, probably due to chlorine. Now notice now this fragments, we have a significant peak here at 77. That's due to fragmentation to give us the phenyl radical and the chlorine atom. We don't see the chlorine atom because it's not charged, so we don't see it in the mass back, but we do see the phenyl cation, and at that point, we no longer see that 3 to 1 uh, ratio between the M and the M plus 2 peaks, or fragments in this case, because the chlorine is no longer on the, the fragment. So that tells us then this is due to the molecular ion. The chlorine atom is still there. The mass makes sense. Uh, that would work out to be the mass of uh, chlorobenzene. And this is the mass plus two due to the number of chlorobenzene molecules that have a 37 isotope of chlorine in there. Now let's take a look, instead of chlorine, let's take a look at uh, bromine. Now notice in this particular example, the base peak turned out to be the molecular ion peak as well. When we look at bromobenzene, the base peak is this one at 77. That's still due to the phenyl cation. And in this instance, the bromine has come off as a bromine atom and left behind the phenyl cation. And we see that peak at 77. But we still have this peak out here that's due to the molecular ion. And notice we have our M+, plus, which is the bromine with an isotope of 79, and the M+, plus 2, which has a bromine with an isotope of 81 in there. So in this case, it breaks up, and our base peak is due to the fragment. And that's because the carbon-bromine bond is a little bit weaker than the carbon-chlorine bond, and we see more fragmentation. Now, if we take and add a methylene unit in there, we now have benzyl bromine. And as it turns out, this is due to fragmentation to form the bromine atom. And a tropillium cation. 
Now the can the, the, we might think that we would see the benzyl cation, but in the gas phase, this rearranges to give a seven-membered ring, what we call tropilium ion. Uh, I wouldn't expect you to, to know that or be able to figure it out. Having said that, both of these will have a fragment at 91. And that will be the base peak because that's a very stable cation. We'll learn later why the tropilium ion is so stable. Uh, hint, something called aromaticity. So we see our typical one-to-one -one pattern for the molecular cation, but it's very small in this case because that carbon-bromine bond is very weak and it's easily fragmented to give our fragment at 91 due to that tropilium cation. Now let's take a look at some other molecules and what's diagnostic in the mass spec for these particular uh, types of compounds. When we have iodine in a compound, we often see a large peak at 127 because iodine plus happens to be a fairly stable uh, ion in the gas phase and we see that peak there. We will also see a fairly large uh, M minus 129 peak because that in this case is due to the ethyl cation. Okay, so we see both of those. But if we suspect iodine in our compound, we want to look out at 127 to see if we see an iodine peak. And you'll notice too that iodine, I don't know if it was in our table of isotopes it is, is almost exclusively iodine-127. So we don't expect to see a large peak uh, beyond 127, like at 128. We do see something there, uh, but it's not significant uh, in this instance. If we have fluorine in compounds, we expect to see a large peak where we split off a fluorine atom Oops, I just renamed a fluorine atom. Okay, so the fluorine carbon bond is easily broken, and when we have fluorine in our compounds, we want to look for an M minus 19 peak. And we see that in both of these instances. Again, here's a typical question that I might give you and ask you to explain. I might give you on a test these two spectra and ask you to compare and contrast these two mass spectra. And what I'm looking for is that both of them have a significant peak at 77, but the fact that this is the base peak, let's... Uh, It's the base peak in this instance, but it's not over here, and that's due to the strength of the carbon-bromine bond being weaker than that of the carbon-chlorine bond. The rest of these look fairly familiar. Uh, we have uh, a molecular ion peak and the typical 3 to 1 ratio for our M and M plus 2 peaks, and over here we have a one-to-one -one ratio of our M and M plus one, okay? So we want to compare and contrast. What are the things that are similar? What are the things that are different? Similar, both of them should be expected to have a phenyl cation. In the instance here, that phenyl cation is the base peak. Over here, it's not. The base peak is due to the molecular ion uh, and not in this case. So we can see then that the molecular ion, the, the M plus 1 and the M plus 2 peaks can all be informative. We can also get some information as to what fragments away from the molecular ion, uh, as we saw in the case of fluorine, iodine. Uh, there's lots of things that are diagnostic.